such an outstanding job for our contribution message today. And then uh, we got to give it up for, uh, for Andre, who really brought us to the cross today. Thank you so much. And it's uh, an honor to be here with the, the Kirstners. And uh, it's an honor to be here with my mother, the Faye, Elena McKee. It's an honor to be here with my incredible wife, Sarah. Mickey. So I'm excited to uh, get into God's word. I said, Mickey, if, if you cheer for me during my lesson, there are rewards. So we'll, see, we'll see how he does. Um, but it is great to preach God's word to you guys today. You know, in the second century, there was a rabbi named Ben He. And he coined a phrase, according to the pain is the gain. Five centuries later, a man named Robert Herrick wrote, little labor, little gains. A man's fate is according to his pains. Now, many hundreds of years later, we have a saying that we all know very well it is no pain, no gain. And that's the time of my lesson for you today. And the, the, the concept is self-explanatory, but I'll still tell you, is that it, it takes pain to grow, to gain. It takes pain to achieve. And, and we know this to be true. And it's a principle, it's a built-in principle of the universe. But here's the reality, we don't really like it. We know it to be true. When we get on the other side of it, we tend to value it. But when we're looking at that which we would want to achieve or that which we'd like to grow in and the pain that it's going to take to get there, we don't like this concept. But here's the reality, it is a principle of God. And pain has been here since the beginning. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We, we have heard about or hopefully know in detail about the fall of man. That God had a rule. He said you could do it every life. You, but there's one tree that you cannot eat of. Do not eat of that tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And man, man had one rule, and man couldn't follow that one rule, and ate of that tree. And, and then the curse comes into existence. We're going to pick it up in Genesis 3, of verse 16. It says, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Here is the first mentioning of pain in the Bible. And it comes to the woman and it says, now it's going to be quite painful for you to give birth to children. And then it says, now your heart's going to be for your husband. And I don't know which one's more painful, giving birth to children or now your heart's going to be for your husband. We'll let the wives give us the answer on that one. But, you know, we, we, because we don't like pain, what have we really uh, come up with to heal ourselves or keep ourselves from this pain? Now you can get an epidural. And I, I'm not against it. If you don't know what an epidural is, it's to give you a shot in your back when you're about to give birth and you can't feel nothing now. And I, I'm not against it. I, I, I'm, I'm pro-epidural. But, you know, in our desire to do away with pain, we try to find a way to numb that pain. It goes on in verse 17. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you must not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food 
until you return to the ground, since it was from it you were taken, dust you are, and dust you will return. The curse for the man that was brought on by herself was that now it's through painful toil that you're going to earn your keep. And there's something that's deeply rooted in every man to that he's got to earn, he's got to provide, he's got to make it happen for the family. And man, it says now if 40 hours a week doesn't get it done, 50 hours, 60 hours, it's going to be through painful toil that you're going to be able to earn your keep in this world. What has man done to try and pacify that pain? Now, if you look at corporate America, it's not like it used to look where it's, you know, suits and ties. Now it's like, hey, let, let's put a bean bag in the corporate office. Now we have bean bags, you know, we got PlayStations, we got plasma screens everywhere. It looks somewhere in between corporate America and Chuck E. Cheese. And we, we, we've tried to just numb the pain of painful toil and earning what you have in this world. Now it's interesting, I was really considering this yesterday. In, in Genesis 3.5, just verses before, Satan speaking, he says, For God knows that when you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the curse really was that we would now be like God. Satan's not lying here. He's actually telling the truth on this one. He says, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good from evil, and now these pains are going to come into your life. Well, let's see these pains in the life of God. Let's go over here to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, in verse 6, it says, The Lord was grieved that he made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Here we see the same affliction that came upon the woman. God created, he in a sense gave birth to man, and he says now he's grieved. There's great pain that came with that birth. The same thing that happened to Eve, it says now with pain, you're going to bring children into the world. Let's see if he has the pain of, of, of toil. Let's turn over here to Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11, it says in verse 1, I'm going to give you an extra second to get there, it's in the, it's in the minor prophets, it says in verse 1, when Israel was a child I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, but the more I called Israel, the further he went from me. They sacrificed the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking him by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. They will, not, will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them? Because they refuse to repent. Swords will flash in their cities. They will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. You know, the work of God has been to get a people of his own. They would be eager to do what is good. And that has been a painful toil to God. Generation after generation, he has planted the seeds, hoping that his sons and daughters would return and be his people. But generation after generation, they've symbolized that of the Israelites in Hosea chapter 11 here. He goes, despite that I led them, despite that I love them, they refuse to turn back to me. They refuse to be my children. And this has been a painful toil for our gods. See... What Satan said was actually true. We would be like God. But here's the thing. God can deal with this pain and still be righteous. And for us as humans, we cannot in the same way. God's able to still maintain perfect righteousness. 
that when pain comes into our lives, man, do we start to go to other things. And here lies the human conundrum. We want to be like God in our lives, but we are not like God. And therefore, we need a savior. We need a rescuer. We need to connect with God to become like him to make it through the great gauntlet that is life. You know, I have a couple points for you that I think could serve as pain management. My first point is don't run from your pain. Let's turn over here to Job 36 verse 21. And I hope you came to church today to get a conviction and not just a feeling. I hope you came here today to learn something, to change something, to do something. Not just to get puffed up with a power thought, only to have it fade as you walk out those doors. But today you would gain learning, knowledge, understanding that can unlock and change things in your life. You know, the Bible says that it will never come back empty. It will always bring back that which it was sent to do. And if you would let it enter your heart today, it will not come back empty. It will change your life. But it makes a decision, every one of us, getting fired up and getting into God's word. Amen. Let's look at Job 36, verse 21. It says, beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. In this scripture is all of your story. And mine for that matter. In this life, you are going to have trouble. Pain enters your life at an early age. We start to see that, wow, our, our, our parents aren't perfect. The society is not perfect. The people start to reject you. Maybe you get bullied. Maybe people don't want to be your friend. All these different things start to happen. And affliction comes into your life. And what we all chose to do, instead of sitting in that affliction and finding God through it, we tend to turn to evil rather than learning to sit in the affliction. See, we, we are terrified of pain. We're so scared of it. It's, it's society has taught us it's the last thing you want in your life. Wow. I remember even from a young age, I was so terrified of like the doctors or the hospital or any of this type of stuff. And one day I was in the mall with my brother, my older brother, and uh, we were in a store. I think they still have it. It's called Spencer's. In the mall, you can find him here or there. And we're, he was playing with this like rubber trinket, and we were always fighting about something. And so he hit me in the head with it. And I was like, oh, that hurt. And then I looked in the mirror, and my hair was this, the same color as, as Mickey's. I looked in the mirror, and my hair was all red. He cracked my head, and, my, and I was bleeding. And I remember the ambulance came in the, in the mall, and I was so scared to go to the hospital that my dad just said, you know what, I'm just going to take him home with a cracked head. <laughs> I somehow talked my dad into it. I never got stitches, none of that. I just went home. <laughs> kept, it, kept something on my head for a couple days, I guess. Another time, I was at a bowling alley. And uh, we, my, my, my dad was in a bowling league with my Uncle Lee, which I'll talk about another time. And my Uncle Lee was very rich. And so my, my, my cousin, Nicole, we would get like $5 to go play at the like, game, you know, the arcade area, the bowling alley. She'd get like $150 at like nine years old. I mean, who gets $150? She's got a $100 bill to play video games. And so... I, I forget what happened, but she took off, and I, I, to this day, this is a mystery of the universe, she was wearing high heels at nine years old, but she took off her high heel and chased after me with it to, to murder me with the high heel. And so I ran out the bowling alley and got hit by a Trans Am. Luckily, it was a low-riding sports car, and so it flipped me. And I landed on the, the, like, the grass, and my, my cousin, Nicole, being the humanitarian that she was, she ran up to me, 
threw something at me, kicked me, and ran back in the bowling alley. And I, I, I was just awake enough to like get kicked. <laughs> and so the ambulance came. I was hit by a car. I could not move my leg. But I was so scared of going to the ambulance, I once again talked my dad into not letting me go to the hospital. I went home. And because I was terrified of pain, I didn't get blood drawn for like 30 years. So I was scared of needles. Finally, I said, I need to get life insurance. So we got life insurance. And the lady came over and she drew blood. The needle was so small, it felt like nothing. I said, man, what's wrong with me? All these years. <laughs> I didn't even feel it. Nothing even happened. But I believe that many of us are like this. That we're absolutely terrified of physical and sometimes even more emotional pain. The reason why we're like this in many ways is that we've been raised in what is called a hedonistic society. Hedonism is, is the, the thought that pain is always bad. How could something that feels bad be good? That makes sense. And that pleasure's always good. How could something that feels good be bad? So we live in a world that is trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. But we know this to be a fallacy intrinsically. And if, if hedonism was really the way to go and we should just try and maximize pleasure from this life, then we should all get a good, you know, opiates addiction. Because you're not going to feel any pain when you're on opioids. And if that's good, then man, that's what you should do. But we look at people who live that lifestyle and we go, wow, it really wrecks up their life. And so we know that living for pleasure will have very negative results in the long run. And in the, on the flip side, we know that pain actually has a very good effect in our life. Yeah. This is why we, we look back at when our parents discipline us, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later. We go, man, my dad did that, but I'm grateful now. Because, yeah. man, I mean, I, was, I needed that. Yeah. And we tend to define our lives as these painful things that we overcome and we grow through. So you have a, we have this great conflict uh, of being taught to run from pain when we actually need to embrace the pains in our life. And because we ran from it, we turned to things. We turned to drugs. I know for myself, I did that. And now we live in a world where the pain management industry is a $90 billion industry. $90 billion. There's 191 million pain prescriptions written every year it's estimated that it's 58 prescriptions per 100 people so literally half of y'all are on pain meds that's the statistic in america and actually 1,000 people go to the er every day from misuse of opioids some people go, well, I, I don't do the drugs thing. Some people turn to shopping. Oh. Retail therapy. You know, there's a, a great short documentary you can watch on YouTube called The Story of Stuff. And what it does is it takes you through what is known as our materials economy. And it takes you through everything you have has gone through this. Every, your pen, your, 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 your pet folio, your phone, your clothes, your shoes, everything has gone through this materials economy. And number one is called extraction. We are literally destroying the world's forests. We, are, we have ruined the waterways. Man, if we're alive 100 years on the, from now on this planet, there's no way that we're living the way we are now. The oil is going to run out. What are we going to do then? I mean, we have so many things from extraction. We have forced many people off their lands of, that have sustained them for hundreds of years and forced them into bigger cities to go and make plastics so that we can have the iPhone 14 because the 13 just isn't good enough anymore. And I don't want my friends to look down on me. I have an iPhone 12. It's like I'm, I'm surprised that anybody even takes my phone calls. And that leads to the next thing, which is production. Then it goes through distribution. Then consumption. 
And then finally, disposal. We are running a linear economy on a finite planet of resources. You cannot run a linear economy on a finite planet of resources. And here's the thing. This didn't just happen. This materials economy was produced. It was thought of. After World War II, there was an economist named Victor Lebeau. And he is coined as saying, our enormous productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life. That we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals. That we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. Wow. And this is the world we live in. Wow. It was designed. The, the, the clothes you're wearing are designed to wear out after two or three years. The phone is designed to break. That we've been raised to consume and we've been taught to do this because while affliction comes in our life, we don't know how to sit in it, so we just go buy things. And we call it the American dream. Some people go, okay, well, you know, I'm a little bit more of a minimalist. And we invest in relationships. Do you know that 90% of relationships that start before the age of 30 end? 90%. So there's literally, if, if you're dating and you don't have an incredible relationship with God, 100% and you're under 30, that relationship's done. No chance. You got a 10% chance that that relationship's going to survive. In fact, I was reading on her.com. And this is what it says. I, I usually check her.com out once a week at least. But I'm going I'm to read you some science here. This is what it says. It's, science says this is how many dates, how many dates you have to go on before you find the one. The average woman will kiss 15 men, enjoy two long-term relationships, have her heart broken twice before she, may, she meets the one a study reveals. Researchers found she will also suffer four disaster dates, be stood up on once, which, amen, I think that's light there, <laughs> but before she finds she is happy to stick with one. But she will also have, have been in, in loved twice, lived with one ex-partner, and have four one-night stands. In comparison, men face being stood up twice, so guys get a little bit more pain there, and have six one-night stands before they meet their ideal partner. So here's what the world tells you. This is what the science community tells you, that it is impossible for somebody to be a virgin and be like that until they get married. It's impossible. But we actually have miracles amongst us as the Oradolas had their first kiss ever at the altar. So with God, we can have miracles. But the world has taught us to turn these relationships and all this stuff rather than just sit in affliction and learn how to turn to God. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 5. What is this produced in us? <laughs> Romans 5, in verse 3. If you're a disciple more than 10 days, your discipler sits down with you in this scripture. <laughs> it says, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Romans 5, verse 3. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. This scripture tells us a fact of life that we know to be true even outside of Christianity. That when you go through suffering, when you persevere through it, if you just get through it, it doesn't matter the quality of perseverance we're talking about here. You could have been dragged kicking and screaming and whining. But if you just get through it, 
And maybe that's how your morning looked to get to church today. But if you just, just because you're here, man, did that perseverance is going to build a little bit of character. Just a little. It's like, it's like a, a grain of sand on the seashore of character. But when you do it a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a 5,000th time, a 5 millionth time, wow, do you start to become a strong person? Okay, well, that's what it teaches, right? It also teaches the opposite. What happens when you don't rejoice in your suffering? And you run from your pain? And you don't persevere? Wow, then that, that, that character is not produced. And some people find themselves 25, 30, 35, 40, 50 years old with the mentality, the character of somebody who's probably 9 or 10 or 12 years old. Even in chemical recovery, they, because people started to turn to use and drug use, they find that when they get into a sober situation and start to deal with themselves, and don't just go run to drugs and alcohol. Don't just, you know, flee. Don't just turn to evil because they're in affliction. That they actually have the character of about 11 or 12 year old boy or girl. Their ability to, uh, to persevere. Their ability to overcome something. Their ability to think logically in these situations. And not just be led by their emotions like they're 8 or 9 years old. is totally gone. And here, I'm your friend. But that's where some of us are at even today. Why? Why? Because you turn to evil rather than sin and affliction. And God has you right where he wants you right now to learn how to build character. See, I grew up, I didn't, nobody cared about having character. It wasn't like you were in middle school and it's like, man, I just want to, I just want to be more noble. <laughs> I'm just really trying to work on, on my integrity. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying. <laughs> No, every, we replaced character with personality. Yeah. We didn't care about having character. We didn't care about persevering or being strong or, you know, being able to stand against the tides of time or, or having a life that would mean something. We just wanted everybody to like us. We just wanted a whole bunch of likes on Facebook. We just wanted to be popular. We just wanted people to laugh at our jokes and think that we were cool. And wow. some of us were so enslaved to, to popularity that, man, we didn't build any actual character. And God wants you to have something that's far more. Uh, when I, I want my kids not to have great personality. I want them to have character. I don't want them to look back and go, wow, my dad, you know, he had the mentality of about a 10-year-old boy, but man, he made me laugh a lot. Oh, no. I want my, my, my son to look at me and go, my, my dad, my dad stood for something. Yeah. My dad took a stand when other people walked away. My dad kept going when other people turned back. My dad handed something down to me that won't fade. And he handed me character. Yeah. And God is trying to turn us into these people. But it's going to take each one of us making a decision to stop running from your pain. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, the last three or four reps is, is what makes muscle grow. This area of pain divides the champion from someone else who is not a champion. That's what most people lack. Having the guts to go on and just say they'll go through the pain no matter what happens. This is one of the greatest bodybuilders in history that I personally relate to in many ways. I, I, I don't understand what's so funny. You know what can be really painful? The truth. Some of you are feeling that pain right now. The, the truth can be really painful. We love the double-edged sword of the truth when it's pointed at other people. We're like, we're, we're, we're ranting and we're, we're cheering at that time. Like, yeah, man. I was going to say it if you didn't. But I'm glad you said it because somebody needed to say it. But nobody likes when that double-edged sword is pointed at you. Whoa. You know, the Bible talks about itself in Hebrews 4.12. It says, 
The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. It will penetrate the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him. So the Bible calls itself a sword. Why? Because it will cut you. It will create pain. Why? Because it's going to show you who you really are and where you're really at. Some of us are studying the Bible. And you've been cut. And all the hedonism that you've been raised with is telling you to run. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I might have to do this. I might have to change that. I might have to get this up. Oh my gosh, this is pain. Run. Run for your life. You know, you ever seen Jurassic Park? What's the whole theme of it? Life finds a way. And God's trying to get us to die to ourselves so we can be resurrected. But your life is trying to find a way. Wow. It's trying to run from the pain. And God is calling you today, no, no, let the Bible cut you. Let it do its work. Because God has a far better plan for you than you could ever. God can only be God. You can't be your own God. Come on. We've been trying to do it since Genesis 3, and the world is wrecked for it. Wow. When are we going to stop and go, no, 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 I'm not God. I don't know what's good for my future. My parents thought that they knew what was good for their future. And look what happened to our family. Look what happened to the parents before them. When are we going to stop believing the lies and let God be who he needs to be in our life? For those of us who are disciples, it doesn't stop. It's like, yeah, you, you just did what we just talked about. Yeah, you got them. I'm glad you said it. I was going to say it after church. But some of us are disciples, but we really don't like discipleship. We don't like the ship. We like the concept, I'm a disciple, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I got the title, but you don't want to practice the discipline of letting people in your life. It's scary. I know. I know. <laughs> letting people in your life to teach, rebuke, correct, and train you with the Bible and show you where you're really at and to be humble and let that happen and let it cut you and show you how you need to grow. You know, Winston Churchill said, criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls to attention an unhealthy state of things. And you have somebody in your life who God has put there, a leader in your life, to show you the areas where you need to grow to be more like Jesus. It may not be agreeable, but it serves as the same function as pain. It's showing the areas of your life that you have not yet grown in. And you've got to make a decision today that you're going to not run from the pain of discipleship. But i got to tell you, my brothers and sisters, pain ain't going to go away. It's here to stay. It will finally leave when it talks about it in Revelation 21, when we finally get to heaven and God wipes away every tear from our eye. And it says there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. But until that day... Pain is here, and we have to make a decision not to run from it. Amen? My second point for you today, hardship is here to help. Hardship is here to help. It's like AAA. It's here to help you when you're broken on down. Let's look here at Hebrews 12. And verse 4. Are you guys with me? Is the sermon too painful? You're, gonna, you're, you're persevering right now. I just want to let all of you know your character is growing in real time right now. It's impressive. Hardship is here to help. Hebrews 12 and verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, 
Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produced a harvest of righteousness and peace for those ha who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. You know, here it tells us, first off, it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted yet to, to the point of shedding your blood. And it tells us the power of motivation here. Sometimes people go, I, I, I want to overcome, I, I, I just can't overcome. So let's say if you were, you know, really struggling with waking up early so that you could have a great quiet time, you just feel like, man, I, I'm just one of those guys, I just, I have a hard time waking up in the morning. Okay, well, what if I told you today that I was going to give you five million dollars? Five million. I showed you the cash. If you wake up every day by 6 a.m. for this year of miracles. Wow. <laughs> Who here? Raise your hand if you think you just couldn't do it. I appreciate her being on. Just, I could not do it. Five million, it could be 50 million. It doesn't matter. I'd never do it. So here's the thing. We all just admitted that we could do it. Wow. Now we just need to work on your motivation. You just, you just said you could do it. I asked you. You're going to say, no, not me. I can't do it. But none of you raised your hand except for one little girl here. But the rest of you said, I can do it. It's the same thing with being pure. It's the same thing with sharing your faith. It's the same thing with whatever it may be. You just haven't been motivated to do it. In the same way that $5 million would motivate you. I would say making it to heaven one day should be much more motivation than a bag of money. And then it tells us about two different types of characters. It says, hey, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when he rebukes you. See, most of us fall into one of these two categories. You either a take it lightly person, that's me. Or me, I'm, I'm naturally a deceived person. I'd be like, the house is on fire. I'm like, I don't really, I don't think it's that bad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we can put this out. <laughs> and then you have the loose heart person. They're like the Atlas person. They just got the weight of the world on their shoulders at all times. They feel their defeats, their discouragement, their sin. It's just so heavy upon them. And here God says, don't be like one. Don't be like the other. Know that you have a father in heaven who's treating you like his son and daughter. Isn't that amazing? Did, I don't know how many of you actually got physically spanked growing up. But if you ever got physically spanked growing up, didn't you just feel so peaceful afterwards? For me, I was, th that's why they, there's a name for it in the South. They go, I got wore out. I got wore out. Because after it, you were just tired. You just, wanted, you just wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> and, and actually, if done in a spiritual way, your kids feel closer to you. Because they feel like, wow, there's real structure here. There's, really, there's enough care that you really, you, you, you love me. And they naturally, they don't connect all these things. It's totally God. That, man, there's a peace that comes when your father in heaven is looking out for you. Would it be better that God just let you do whatever and just didn't look out for you? God is trying to train you so that you could do something awesome for him. It says all hardship is discipline, the whole category. I don't care if you fell down a flight of stairs. You should get up and go, whoa, I got to stay on the narrow path. <laughs> if you got a ticket, you got, whoa, I got to be more diligent. Yeah. I should have read, I should have, I should have been more focused there. Oh, I got to learn from that. No matter what happens in life, 
hardship, the whole category is discipline from God when you're really walking with God. And there's a great comfort in it because, you know, it, 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 without this, we tend to get bitter over life. And, but you can, st instead of getting bitter, you can get better. You can see God training you and working in your life that by the time you get 30 or 40 years old, man, you're a sharp, strong, capable, humble person. Because you've been walking with God and he's been teaching you and he's given you hardship and those hardships have actually helped you. Wow. You know, I was reading in Psychology Today and Psychology Today, there's a great uh, debate on what is worse for a child, abuse or neglect? And many counselors actually believe that, uh, that neglect is worse than abuse. Because even abuse tells a kid that you mean something to me. I'm willing to do something here. But neglect, nothing means that you're completely worthless to me. And they say the psychological impact of neglect is actually worse than abuse. But God's not a neglectful father. He's not going to just leave you alone. If you're his son, if you're his daughter... He's got a vested interest in you making it all the way. Wow. It says it is he who's going to work in you to bring it to completion. That one day you get to be before God. You know, in Job 7 verse 17, it says, What is mankind that you make so much of them, wow. that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Wow, I hope you had a quiet time this morning about God because God had one about you. He examined you this morning. And even right now, how you're receiving this lesson is a real-time test from God. He's testing you every moment. Right now, if you just thought, no, he's not, well, you just failed that test. He's testing you to see, are you going to be humble? Are you going to look at God as your father? Are you going to see hardship as discipline from God that he's trying to train you through it? And see, well, God helps me with hardship. You know, verse 11, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace from those who have been trained by it. You know, I'd call us as a people to allow the hardships in your life to train you and not terrorize you. Wow. So God is working in my life. He's trying to get me to be what he wants me to be. My third and final point for you today is a short one. I think when you start to see God this way, when you start to walk with God this way, you can actually come to a point where you love to train in your pain. You love to train in your pain. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger also said, pain makes me grow. Growing is what I want. Therefore, pain is my pleasure. Let's look over here in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials... Of many kinds, because you know that the test in your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When you see every difficulty in life as testing and training from God, you can actually start to relish it. You know, in San Francisco, there's a period of time where our, our, our brother, who's now in the East region named Ryan Canceres, he was always seemingly going through some situation, and he would deal with it, and he'd go, this is good for me. <laughs> and so we, we made shirts that said, this is good for me. Yeah. And it became somewhat of a slogan of how to relish the things that you're going through with God. And go, you know what, whatever happened, this is good for me. Here it says, consider pure joy. Each of us need to learn how to really embrace your spiritual funny bone. You ever hit your funny bone? It hurts, but you laugh. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, that's terrible. <laughs> you need to have a spiritual funny bone 
where you go through something, but it doesn't destroy you, but you laugh at it. You start to relish it. You know, Charles Chaplin said, to, to truly laugh, you must be able to take your pain and play with it. And that's the strength of Christianity. You could sing in prison at midnight. You can be thrown into a fiery furnace and not lose your zeal. You could go through anything and learn how to take that pain and even play with it. You know, it says in Hebrews 5 that Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. And through that, he became a source of eternal salvation for all. And God is trying to do the same thing for each one of us today. He's trying to make you perfect through what you're suffering so that you can then be a source of salvation by holding out God's word to the next person and calling them to enter into this incredible relationship with God. And I'm going to close out with one last quote from the great poet, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> he said, the pain that you hold is yours. There is not a single pain quite like it. No one else on God's green earth can feel this pain or have its indescribable feeling of pride when you, you will have when you overcome it. This pain is not a curse. This pain is your privilege. Wow. You know, I think Jesus said it the best. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. You will have pain. But take heart. I have overcome come the world. My brothers and sisters, it's time for us in the Metro Coast and the South region. Let's take heart and let's overcome this world because we know when there is no pain, there is no gain. I love you guys very much.